they get they get their 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 poop suits as I like to call them chat, which is you know basically the the purpose as, as Doctor Kine explains. Uh, she's like a fremen. I think she's a fremen too or something, or she's like you've been in, integrated into the fremen culture or something because her eyes are blue as fuck, and so she's constantly high on that spice, baby. And she's like, yeah, no, good to have you guys here. And she's going over everyone's suits, and she you know making sure everyone's you know got their their boots on right and they got their gloves on tight, right? And she gets to Paul, and she's like, Paul. You put your boots on correctly. Have you worn a poop suit before? He's like, no, nah, just just looked like the way to put them on. And she's like, oh my god, this guy's the Messiah! <laughs> Holy shit! You hear the you hear the, you hear the you hear the handmaid in the back. You hear the lady in waiting in the back going, ah! <laughs> I was like, quiet, you quiet. Again, so good to have you guys all here today, and obviously we're only a couple of days away from the official release of Dune Part 2, Sandworm Boogaloo, right? Everyone's excited for it, a lot of people are excited for it, the film so far has been getting uh, rave reviews, and you know, I thought, you know what? I should probably revisit the first movie. I originally wasn't going to revisit the first movie, to be completely honest with you guys. You know, last night, I was having a good time. I was enjoying my jug wine. I decided, like, ah, I'm not going to be going out after this. not going to be dashing or anything. So let me just enjoy the rest of this evening and kind of just, you know, vibe out. And I, I popped an edible, boofed an edible, if you will. And uh, I, uh, I thought, you know what? After the stream, I was like, you know, doing a little meal prep and stuff. And I was like, yeah, it's still pretty early. And I was like, you know what? Let me go ahead and actually rewatch Dune Part 1. Let me just go ahead and do that. I'm like, maybe I'll have a change of opinion, you know, be on this edible, enjoying my jug wine, have a new perspective. Because, you know, as I said uh, years ago, because this movie originally came out in 2021, I believe, after delays because of the pandemic and everything else. Always, all these, always these Dune films are affected by something, whether it be pandemics or strikes or who knows what will happen if they do a third, which I imagine they will. Dune, Dune Part Three, or the or the, the, the Dune Messiah, or whatever it might be called, Children of Dune. Um, but for those that don't know, I, I wasn't like the biggest fan of the first movie, of Part One. I didn't, I wouldn't say I disliked it, like I liked it well enough, but I did not love it like other people did, you know, I, I, I would, to praise it at the top, I will say, I think it's an absolutely gorgeous looking movie, gorgeous looking, beautiful special effects and practical effects, CGI production design, in, incredible, you know, one of, one of the, uh, one of the most beautiful looking movies, certainly one of the most beautiful looking sci-fi films, fantasy films, genre films of, of this particular decade so far, you know, I don't think that's exactly hyperbolic to say, like, um, what good old Denny Villeneuve, or whatever you want to call him, what he was able to do in terms of, uh, bringing life to, uh, Frank Herbert's world, I think he, he nailed it, no, 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 no question um, and a lot of people felt the same way about the production design, but I honestly just wasn't a, a really big fan of the, of the story and, and, and the characters. Like, you know, it very much felt like kind of, um, like the first couple of chapters <laughs> of, of, of the book, which I suppose it is, but it felt awkward to me, especially by the end where it felt like, all right, this kind of feels like the beginning of the second act. And then we just gonna we're just going to cut it right there which was very odd. But the other thing that really bothered me is this is like, I never really, I never really liked any of the characters or I just didn't feel like they were all that well written or had that much depth. I think that was my problem. They, no one had like a lot of depth uh, or was very interesting to follow in my opinion. Like the one person I kind of gravitated towards who actually felt like a, like a human, <laughs> felt like a person was uh, Jason Momoa as uh, Duncan Idaho. I actually liked him quite a bit. But then so many of the other characters in this world, they were just kind of all felt very, very flat to me. Um, from, you know, Timothy Chalamet to Rebecca Ferguson, certainly to the, the, the villains, the Harkonnens or Harkonnens as they're calling him in the movie. I just didn't work. Everyone's doing that whisper speak. It's like, fear is the mind killer and, and uh, I can't be afraid because I, I will be, become the, the, the savior and the messiah and I am Muwati. It's like, hey, fucking wake up. I can't hear you. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, I just, yeah. Um, I didn't really care, care for all, for all that. Uh, it just, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't connect with, with the world, despite the world obviously being so beautiful, so wonderfully realized aesthetically, right? There's no, there's no, there's no question about that. I just, yeah, I just, I didn't, I didn't really particularly care for the story or the, at least the story that they had told up to that point. 
or really the characters. And so, yeah, I, I to be honest, I have not been as excited going into Dune Part 2 as other people have, like, you know, and, and you know, anticipating it, you know, because, yeah, I, I, I didn't love the, the first movie, Part 1, uh, obviously. Uh, but, you know, there's been a lot of praise for the film so far, and people are, are saying that it is a, a, a much better, significantly better than than Part 1, which which is good, and I'm hoping that they provide the depth of the characters that, that I want, because I think that's the thing that's, you know, when I originally watched Part 1, that I felt was was lacking. But do I have a change of opinion uh, about this film? I'm going to let you guys know about that at the end of this particular review, kind of my my new thoughts, or maybe I'll just be reiterating my same thoughts <laughs> at the end of the review. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. But, yeah, we got to start at the beginning, and we're above uh, Arrakis, uh, which is a very important planet in this fictional universe created by Frank Herbert Chap because Arrakis, also known as Dune, is the sole planet, as far as I was told, by uh, the narrator of the opening. Good old Zendaya Chap plays the girl uh, uh, Chani in, the, in this movie for like five minutes. But she's going on about how, well, Dune is the sole source of spice, and spice is, is used by numerous people, including her people, the Fremen who have occupied Dune for generations upon generations upon generations there, right? Uh, they, 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 they use the spice for me medical purposes, to have crazy, trippy-ass visions and stuff, and I, I imagine they have found all sorts of ways to insert it into their various holes, no question. But! The rest of the of the universe, the many great powers that be, the empire and the uh, the many houses of this universe, they use the spice uh, for space travel. Chad, if if they are not farming the spice, then they would not be able to travel across the universe, to travel across the cosmos. Chad and like. Yeah, you know, like culturally, economically, uh, like everything across the board would just shut down without this, right? And so. You've had many d different houses and things that have occupied Dune and have farmed this spice, and I guess the one that has been occupying the planet for, I think they say, like, what, around 80, 100 years has been House Harkonnen, or as they say in the movie, Harkonnen. I don't give a shit, chat. Mommy and Daddy named it Harkonnen. That's how my mommy and daddy have always said it, so they're Harkonnens, but whatever, Harkonnens, and they are very, they're very brutal people. <laughs> They're not. They're not very nice. <laughs> not very forgiving. You know, they're 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 well, they're 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 straight up colonizers, chat, and they've been um, uh, uh, fighting against the Fremen for quite some time. But the Fremen have been fighting the good fight. But you know, seemingly they cannot stop the power of Har Har House Harkonnen and and the, and the forces that be. And they've kind of fought in this guerrilla warfare for quite some time, and not you know at least disrupting uh, operations, not exactly, you know, dismantling the entire thing or doing any significant true damage to um, House Arcona. And Zendaya, she's narrating all of this chat. She's talking about her people, talking about Dune, talking about Harkonnen. She's like, I know nothing but war since I was born. And she's going on and on and on. And we don't, and the next time we see her is kind of like in visions and stuff and dreams. Um, she really doesn't, have like a significant role in the movie like any significant role in the movie until like the very end of the film when she shows up for like the last 15 minutes uh, but we'll get to that in just a bit but uh, we, we follow a very small we follow a very small emaciated looking white boy uh, a good old good old Paul Atreides shed of House Atreides he's having these crazy dreams he goes oh, and he wakes up and he's like I just dreamt about that like sexy uh, girl who's, you know, talking about spice and things. He's been having these visions for quite some time, and, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's sad. He's always sad. He's always downtrodden, always sad, always looking at his goddamn feet. Like, Paul, look at me. Look at me in the eyes, goddammit. And, um, you know, he's, he's been having these weird things for a while, and he's been talking about them with his mom. Good old lady Jessica Chad, who's the concubine to uh, House of Trades, specifically uh, good old Duke Leto. Good old Duke Leto of Trades. We'll meet him in a second. But he's getting breakfast with his mama, and his mama is like, you having them trippy dreams again, son? He's like, I sure am, Mom. I keep dreaming about this, like, really sexy girl. She's like, speak up! I can't hear you! I was having these sexy dreams about the sexy girl. He's like, oh, okay, okay. Hey, uh, practice uh, using the voice with me. Have you been practicing using the voice? And he's like, yeah, I guess so. And so uh, the voice is basically, it's telepathy. And people are going to, the Doom Books are saying, it's not telepathy. 
based on what I've observed and how it's used, it's kind of like telepathy. It's 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 suggestion where you're you're able to take control of another person and and speaking telepathically and make them do certain things for you, right? And so. He's, uh, and also just like saying things out loud as well. But, you know, he starts, he starts speaking and it's like, you got to do better than that. You got to adjust your pitch. He's got like a pitch problem, Jay. He got like a pitch problem and he does it again. She's like, God, Jesus. And it makes her move. Like he, she asks like, um, make me give you this glass of water. And he's like, give me the water. And she's like, God, and she gets a little derby for a second. She kind of moves it. And then she stops. She's like, you're not quite there yet, kid. You're, but not bad, not bad. You just got to practice some more. And so he has a nice good old breakfast with a uh, good old mom, concubine mom. Uh, he, he has a training session with uh, Josh Brolin at one point. Josh Brolin, who plays this character named Gurney, he's like one of the guys, one of the big uh, top-tier uh, soldiers that has trained a Atreides um, uh, military force, right? And they're and they like, all right, we got to get to stabbing each other, chat. And, you know, Paul's just like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm better than you, old man. And it's like, well, let's fucking see. And they start to, they turn on these uh, shields. Now, the shields are interesting. I actually like the shields. And like the battle sequences in, in this in this movie, and they're pretty cool. Where they turn on these like personal shields that cover your entire body, but um, when you you can't like when you shoot like I don't know, like a laser at them, it's gonna just bounce off and shit. It's not it's not gonna work. And so you physically so in this in this world you have to use like a lot of melee weapons like knives and swords and axes and stuff. It's like oh okay because. When you like, uh, when you, you know, shoot them again, it's gonna bounce off. But even when they're they're fighting close quarters and they're like hitting the sh the the shields like really fast, it bounces off too. So in order to like go in for the kill, you need to like learn how to fight in such a way. We got to be fast, but then like slow at the last minute where you can penetrate the shield and then like stab them in the tummy or slit their throat. And so it's like an interesting like fighting style. And so I, I did like that. I think I think that's pretty cool. And so. Uh, you know, Josh Brolin is good. He's just kicking. He's just kicking. You know, Paul, uh, uh, Paul's ass. And at one point, like Paul seemingly gets the, you know, uh, the drop on Josh Brolin. But Josh Brolin's like, Nah, man, I got this. Point at your little emaciated uh, tum tum. He's like, Damn it! And he's like, Listen, you gotta take this stuff seriously, okay? He's just like, You know, why? What's the big deal? Because we got many enemies in this universe, including Harsh Harkonnen. They're not. They're not people. They're not human. They're they're Brutal, as he says. It's like, Jesus, someone like raised their voice in the movie. I was like, God damn, he really gave me a heart attack. Uh, and it's like, well, okay, shit. You know, like uh, House Harkonnen, uh, we need to keep a, a close eye on them. Eventually, Paul, he goes and meets with another very big, burly man, um, uh, um, Jason Momoa, who still is my favorite character in this film. He plays Duncan Idaho, who's like one of the best soldiers in the Atreides uh, army forces. He's a pilot. He's an incredible uh, warrior chat. And he's going to be leading the initial like uh, ground team to investigate uh, Dune and to meet up with the Fremen and to organize some type of like negotiation and like peace talks between House Atreides and and the Fremen. Uh, since, you know, Harkonnens are told to get the fuck out of there, right? Because they're, um, they've, um, They've been uh, uh, removed from power thanks to the Emperor Christopher Walken. And Paul is just like, Duncan, I've had these dreams and I'm confused about these dreams. I've seen your death. And he's like, well, man, dreams are just dreams, baby. Real life is real. That's, that's, what, that's what I fucking know. So I wouldn't worry about it, Paul. And he's like, okay, I'll see you later, I guess. Bye. And so then he goes and he meets up with his dad, who is also sad. I was like, now I know where he gets it from. <laughs> Oscar Isaac is just a sad dad throughout this in entire goddamn uh, movie. <laughs> Because we just see him, he's like sitting on this cliffside in in this, I guess, you know, all these mausoleums are surrounding, like basically it's the Atreides graveyard, all the great leaders of House Atreides and stuff. And I guess he's, you know, he's sitting by the mausoleum, the gravestone of, of his father and, you know... Paul's feeling down because he doesn't feel like he's like living up to the Atreides name and what it could be. And, you know, Oscar Isaac, who's also equally sad, he's like, hey, listen, man. Hey, listen, because Paul Trees is like, I don't know if I can be what you want me to be to be the next leader of our of our house. And, you know, Duke Leto is just like, listen, you know, back in the day, I just want to be a pilot. I love ships, love, you know, all that. That was great. And uh, I had to make the sacrifice to become, you know, who, who I am now, which is a very sad fucking dad that everyone dismisses. 
<laughs> like no, no one kind of takes Duke like a Duke Leto very seriously. Everyone's just like, this guy's this guy doesn't have it together. <laughs> he's very easily manipulated. Boy, is he! And um, he's like, listen, if if you're not the future of this house. Uh, that's fine because at the end of the day, you'll be what I always wanted you to be. He's like, what's that, Dad? And he's like, you'll be my son. I was like, oh, that's, that was a nice little exchange. And, you know, he's like, oh, so it's like, um, it's the Emperor's like entourage showing up to give you, you know, the Dune. He's like, yep, they should be here any minute. And then again, we get, we see this, these amazing shots, these amazing shots of like these ships, like entering the atmosphere and going down to like, they're huge. They're like Leviathan size chat. And like everyone, everyone's like fucking lined up the entire goddamn family all lined up and you know, waiting for the emperor's entourage. Right. And we have this one guy, they come down, they open up the, 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 the spaceship and they're walking down. We have the, the one guy looks like a priest or something all gilded up and everything. He's also got these weird scrotum people behind him. These guys that look, they have like these spacesuits on and like that looks like the spice is being pumped up into the goddamn suits. There's like, <sighs> there's huffing spice. There's huffing spice the entire time. And they, did, they look like giant testicle people. <laughs> it reminds me of the, um, of the original film in 1984 where we met that giant fucking testicle. I think they're called like navigators, I guess. I guess like, yeah, they belong to an organization called, like, the Space Guild, or the Navigation Guild, or whatever, and, you know, they help with, like, space travel and things, but I guess at one point, you get, like, if you, you huff enough spice, you get enough spice in your system, you get too much, you, over, you overdose on spice, you become a giant scrotum penis monster, that's what you become, so these guys are, like, halfway into, like, being a scrotum monster, it's like, they're not really human, they're not full scrotum penis, but they're, like, in, they're, like, in between. That, that's what they are, Chad. They're like, they're like, they got like baby dick faces. That's the guy. It, it's like, it's like, you know, that, that's, that's kind of their, their whole look. And it's horrifying. I was like, God damn, please co cover up for the love of God. Any case, uh, they do the whole fucking royal decree. And, you know, good old Duke Leto, he's like, well, shit, I guess I'll just use my ring here and to make the, make my signature matter. And then he's like, well, I guess that's it. And the guy who is, like, representing the emperor is just like, yes, that's it indeed. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, that's probably not good. <laughs> This guy can't, can't contain the fact that, yeah, we're totally just going to fuck you guys all over. I'm just like, yeah, that's it. And they just walk up, him and the fucking baby dick men, walk up into their spaceship, and they and they fuck off. But it's like, hey, well, okay, who are they taking over for, chat? Harkonnens. The Harkonnens. So we got we got to go ahead and, and see what's going on in their world. I think it's called Giddy Prime. This place sucks. It looks fucking miserable. It looks heavily polluted, Chad. Not as great as certainly do. Uh, or or the uh, Trades homeworld, which looks you know very lush and filled with oceans and greenery and things. Looks very beautiful. Har the the Harkon homeworld looks fucking awful. And we come up on Dave Batista, who just screams all of his fucking dialogue in this movie. He's the he's the one at eleven constantly. Like everyone else in this movie, with the exception of Duncan Idaho, who is you know feels like a real person. Uh, uh, Dave Batista is at a fucking 11 constantly in this film. And he goes and meets his, his, his uncle, uh, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, who is the, the leader of the, of the Harkonnen family. And Baron Harkonnen, he's just played my Stellan Scars girl. He's just this giant fucking gray looking fat guy. He looks like he weighs like 600 goddamn pounds and he's just sitting there naked and he's getting like, I guess he's, he's hot. So he needs like a mist machine. He's like, oh. What is it, nephew? He's like, Uncle, we have handed, uh, we have left the planet, and 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 the, the emperor has taken it from us, and and they're giving us to our enemies, dude. Trades, I hate them, Uncle. And he's like, When is a gift? <gasps> Not a gift, my nephew. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. He's just like, the emperor, he is, a, he is a, 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 a mean man. And he is spiteful as, as, as well. Do not worry. All shall be revealed. Pretty much showing up, you know, basically, you know, indicating that um, uh, the Emperor and the Harkonnens are kind of in on it together, Chad. This is a whole scheme, a whole ruse. But yeah, we, we meet the Harkonnens. It just looks like a gross, polluted uh, BDSM world, that's how I would describe it, Chad, it's just like, what the fuck happened to this place, it's very, it's very creepy, very creepy, but the villains in this movie, I, I still stand by this, they kind of suck, 
They're just, they're just, they're just bad guys. They're just, you know, we only get to know the Harkonnens at all. They're just kind of there. They don't really get that much scenes. Like even Bar Baron Vladimir uh, Harkonnen, which Selen Skarsgård is a great actor, and he, he he's, he's given like excellent monologues and things. Like uh, look at it, like a, another side for property he was he was in Star Wars. He was in um, Andor, and he has gets some great dialogue, and he gets like a wonderful monologue at one point. And here, despite like how we're told, we're always told like how intimidating the Harkonnens are and how scary like. Uh, the Baron is, and he looks scary, but I don't know. They don't really do that many interesting things of him, to be perfectly honest. And Batista's just screaming all of his fucking dialogue all the time. I'm just like, all right, well, whatever. Um, well, eventually we cut back to uh, the Atreides homeworld, and the, the Ben and Jerry witches show up. I think they're called the, the Bene Gesserit. I'm going to call them Ben and Jerry's, right? And the head of the Ben and Jerry's wants to talk to Lady Jessica because, uh, because Lady Jessica, she belonged to the Ben and Jerry's group, good old Ben and Jesuit. And, you know, she was, you know, basically sold as a concubine. That's what the Bene Gesserit does. They're like this, they're, they're like this organization who has, you know, like, these powers, has the voice and things, and they implant themselves in, like, all these royal families and the emperor and, you know, across the board. And, like, their whole thing is they want to, like... Uh, obviously, uh, uh, amass you know knowledge and wealth, of course, for their for their order. But they're also hoping that they that one of their concubines eventually, one of their witches, like like gives birth to this 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 religious figure. The, they call it something, uh, the 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 Kwanzaa cataract, I think. <laughs> I think it's called, I think they call it the Kwanzaa Cataract, and they're like, listen, you gotta give birth to this Kwanzaa Cataract, baby, okay, because this person is gonna lead us into, like, a much better future, like, they're like, the emperor and all that, that ain't, that ain't working out, give birth to the Kwanzaa Cataract, and we can, it'll be, it'll be aces, it'll be, it'll, it'll be, it'll be fantastic, and, uh, but typically, typically, like, these witches, they usually give birth to, like, girls and things, to, like, because it's, it's an all-female order, as far as I know, and I guess, like, anytime they attempt it, like, they, they need specific parameters to have, like, a boy child, and Jessica said, fuck that bullshit, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give birth to the Kwanzaa Cataract, and, and, you know, she didn't, and, or at least they, possibly, it's, it's possible that Paul Atreides might be the Kwanzaa Cataract, for all we know. And so Ben and Jerry Witch, she shows up. She's like, fucking get him out of bed. I got to do the test with him. And Jessica's like, okay. And she's just crying throughout the scene because, like, you know, he could possibly die, I guess. And so, you know, Paul, you know, good old Paul, he's having a dream about Zendaya again. He's like, no, oh, Zendaya. And uh, she's like, you got to get up. You got to go see the Ben and Jerry's Witch. And he's, he's like, huh? He's like, don't worry. I'll explain everything on the way. And so she explains. She's like, listen, this is a very dangerous situation. Just be, play it smart. You know, don't, you know, like, disobey her and everything will be all right. And he's like, okay, mama. And they kind of communicate with each other via, like, telepathy. So he goes into this very scary fucking room. Um, looks like, like, uh, uh, like something out of Alien or something. But he goes in there, and the Ben and Jerry's witch is there, and he, she, he's like, uh, hi, my name's Paul. And she goes, I'll kill you! And she, she has this, like, this little, like, needle, this little needle, and she says, this is the most deadliest needle in the universe. And he's like, okay. And she's like, if it pierces your skin, you're gonna fucking drop dead just instantly you're gonna die and he's like i don't want to die he's like yep so put your hand in the box he's like what's in the box pain <laughs> i was like holy shit did you just become mr she became mr t for a second and he's like all right and so he puts his hand in the box and uh it starts fucking hurting like real goddamn bad he's like and everything like so i can't imagine like what that thing's doing to his hand but and like his mom is trying to help him through it she's telepathically connecting to him and everything but paul he seems to be resisting the pain and he's not removing his hand from the box or anything uh, and he's like literally like looking at the Ben and Jerry's witch and she's like, Jesus, you know, and then he starts like, you know, I think he starts talking at one point trying to use the voice. She's like, all right, all right, enough, enough, enough. All right. Yep. You, you passed the test. You passed the test. There is hope for you yet, Paul Atreides. And she's like, see you later. And then the, she leaves. And she goes and talks to Lady Jessica, and because you know she's gonna like they were there secretly actually they're not supposed to be not there at the request of the Emperor you know Christopher Walken, and you know she's kind of pissed off at Jessica. She's like, listen, you you weren't you were supposed to like not give birth to a boy. Obviously, she's like, yeah, no, I'm sorry about that, but could he be the Kwanzaa cataract? And she's like, maybe we don't know, we don't know. 
And she's like, listen, listen, the only thing I can promise you, like, you know, things are in motion right now. A lot of bad things are in motion. Uh, all I can say is, is that our order will protect you and your son. I can't fucking tell you I'm gonna, we're going to protect your husband. That's, that's out of our goddamn hands, okay? But you can, I can assure you we'll protect you. And then she flies off in her ship. Meanwhile, she goes and meets at the Harkonnens. And we, <laughs> this is fucking, this is great. This, this scene's great. The first shot is this weird, it's like this, I can't even describe it. It's like this, this spider butt boy. It's this spider, like, humanoid thing that has, like, a big, like, gross ass, like, cheeks and everything. And it's just eating this slop with an with its hands. And the Ben and Jerry's witch is like, get that gross shit out of my sight. And, you know... Davis Dallas Malchin, he plays one of the Harkonnen. He's like a, a thing called a Mentat. They got like these other psychics in there, and they get like a Mentat for every house. He's like, you don't have nothing to fear for uh, fear of our pet, and it wouldn't even understand you. And she's like, get out! And, and the, the the spider butt boy's like, oh shit. <laughs> I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> and the spider butt boy uh, leaves. He's like, it, uh, it understands. And she's talking to uh, Baron Harkonnen. And I guess they have like this thing where they have this um, cone of silence that drops down. They have this thing called a cone of silence and it drops down. so like no one can hear their conversation, I guess. So, um, and she's like, listen, Baron Harkonnen. Because uh, she's she's privy to like the scheme. The, I guess the Bene Gesserit just know about this because they're loyal, quote unquote, to the emperor. And she's like, listen, um, I know you and the emperor are going to attack Arrakis and things and uh, you're going to kill the duke, whatever. Uh, but uh, you cannot harm Paul Atreides or his mother, Lady Jessica. That, that those, those are our people. OK, and uh, we would not appreciate it if you would do that. And Barrow Conan's like, bah, bah, don't worry. No harm will come. I will not. We will not kill them. We will we will not kill the. Uh, the, 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 the heir of Atreides or your fellow Ben and Jerry's witch. And she's like, cool. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get going. And she leaves. And, uh, David Desmalachian's like, Hey, but if like, uh, Paul Atreides like lives, then he could like, you know, gain favor from the survivors of the battle and, you know, and then all the, you know, the, 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 the house of Atreides will rise up and Duke's like, I shut up. I lied to her. I lied to her. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna kill them. I, I didn't say, well, you know, the desert will kill them. That's what will happen. It's like, I won't lay a fucking hand on them, but we'll just fucking, you know, we'll just throw them in the desert and they'll get vored by a sandworm, okay? Because, you know, Arrakis is mine. It's mine. And then he turns on his floaty thing. He kind of floats up and he goes, my Arrakis, my dude. And it's like, okay, cool. And so eventually, uh, we cut we cut from that from the Spider Butt Boy and Baron Harkonnen, and we're traveling to Dune now. The whole family's going to Dune, yay! And uh, they land there. And it's like this whole big fucking thing. They got bagpipes and shit. And it's like that's neato. Uh, and they're why it's very hot. It seems very fucking hot there. It's like well, there's a lot of fucking sand. It's coarse and rough. It's getting everywhere. In every single crack and every orifice you got, Chad, sand's going up the booty hole, no doubt about it. And we see, like, some of the locals in this massive, like, city. And they're all going, ah! They're, like, they're, they're, they're really jazzed to see Paul because apparently the Bene Gesserit has been, like, like spreading rumors that the Messiah, the good old Kwanzaa Cataract, is coming. And that's where, like, ah! They love him. He's like, cool, this is, this is kind of nice. This is kind of nice. And um, we meet the Trades Mentat, and he's like, "Oh yeah, we sweep the city. Uh, it's it's perfectly safe now, no issues whatsoever." And you know, Duke of Trades is like, "That's cool, man. I I love that. That sounds great." Uh, also, Duncan returns. Uh, Duncan returns at one point, and apparently he was hanging out with the Fremen for like quite a while. He, he did find them, and we learn a lot more information about them, which is pretty cool. He'll detail more about that in just a bit before we meet uh, the the captain of the of the Fremen Spit Boy. But, uh, you know, they, they're getting settled in the city. It's, again, beautiful. It's immaculate looking. Very cool. Very cool. And then we get, like, one of the weirdest scenes in the movie <laughs> where Lady Jessica, she's like, well, I need, I need a new lady in waiting. And so I guess, you know, we, we got to get a local for that. I feel like you would want to get your, uh, someone you're, 
like loyal to or someone who's like loyal to you from like the planet you've lived on for however many knows how many goddamn years at least 20 or so years and um she's like yeah let's get one of the locals and uh she's going down the line she settles on this person she's like all right rest of you brats can go and they all leave and she's like hey i know you got like a stabby thing in there that could possibly uh, kill me and uh, she's like, I do have a stabby thing, but I'm not using, I won't use this to kill you. I, I, I want to give this to you, which you can then give to the Kwanzaa cataract. And uh, she's like, okay. And then, the, <laughs> and then the woman, for whatever reason, like when I was watching this last night, I was like, okay, all right, all right, this is, this is odd. But, you know, she's a representative of the people there that believes in, you know, Paul. But <laughs> she gives out like this ridiculous cry, this, ah! <laughs> whoa, 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 what's going on here? <laughs> and I'm like, that, that, that was, that was unnecessary. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus, what happened? And like, Lady Jessica's got like no fucking reaction. She's like, I don't want to set off this psychopath. But she's like, yeah, you know what? You can serve me in my household. You seem like a normal person. She's like, fantastic. Ah! <laughs> Let her carry around this fucking bone knife. And I'm like, okay, all right, okay. Um... But yeah, we're 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 touching base of good old Duncan Idaho. And Duncan's like, oh man, uh, the Harkonnens were absolutely wrong about the Fremen. The Fremen, they're pretty goddamn cool. And everyone's asking, like, what makes them so cool? It was like, well, we were looking uh, for them for like you know the first few days, didn't spot any signs of life, and they snuck up on me, and I had to fight for my life. And I gotta tell you right now, I've never I've never come this close to dying before. It was really fucking close. Like, these people fight like goddamn demons. And he's, like, really excited about, like, the way... Again, I think, I think, I think Jason Momoa is the best... He's the best, like, actor in the movie. He literally is. He's just... He's giving me so much. He seems, like, excited about the material. He's got, like, a fucking smile on his face. Like, hell yeah, dude. He's like, yeah, Fremen are awesome. And... He was describing them, and, you know, I survived, of course, and I was eventually welcomed into their community because, you know, of, the, of, of, of my survival, and they, respect, you know, I showed them respect, they showed me respect, and apparently Harkonnen estimates put, like, the entire front population at maybe, like, 50,000. That was bullshit. The Harkonnens don't know jack shit. Uh, I went down to their, I think they're called crutches, crutches or something like that, when they're, like, these huge underground communities, and that's where the majority of the population of the Fremen are is underneath a uh, dune underneath Arrakis where they have technology. They have like, you know, a, a, just, you know, drinking water down there, just entire, like their entire civilization is underground. And he estimates like, there's probably like, like a million people living down there. There's like a million people. And there's like hundreds of fucking crutches around like dune. So that means like the, the, the Fremen population is tens of, of millions, if, if, if not, if not more. And everyone's like, fucking great job, Duncan. He's like, yeah. I was like, yeah. And that was, was kind of cool of him. He's like, you know what's funny? This movie does a lot of um, telling and not showing. But what does significantly help, uh, even if you are doing some telling and not showing, uh, to get like an actor in there who just seems so fucking excited to talk about it. And it's like, you kind of get into it too. It's like, oh shit. Because he was, he was like, again, he's like one of the few people in there who's not like monotone for most of it and like giving his explanations. And I was like, shit, this is interesting all of a sudden. Because then there's like other times when like there's like Paul, like he, he listens to this recorder and it's just like a fucking lecture about the Fremen and shit. And it's like super monotone, but like to literally have like just Moa come in there and talk about them. It's like it got me excited about the Fremen. <laughs> I was like, cool. And he's like, yeah. And then their leader, Spit Guy, Stillgar the Spit Boy, as I like to call him, chat. He's arriving there. He's the leader of the Fremen, or at least is, is a leader of the Fremen. I don't know if he is the leader, but he is one of the high ranking leaders. And he's uh, come here to, to negotiate with us. And they're like, okay, cool. And so they set up a meeting, and good old Stilgar, he doesn't say much, but, you know, uh, you know, good old Duke Atreides, Oscar Isaac, hey, Stilgar, great to have you here. Um, you know, we just wanted to set up this meeting because we know the Harkonnens have not treated you well. They've, they've butchered us for years. He's like, I, yep, 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 they have. Uh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And we, I wanted to extend uh, uh, any sort of hospitality that I can, you know, towards you. And while we here, while you occupy our world, he's like, well, we, we, we were asked to harvest the spice, but I, I don't wish to get into conflict with you. We will have to go into the desert, obviously, to harvest it, but I can promise you that uh, we, we will not attempt to go after your crutches or we will not attempt to uh, disturb your, your practices. You know, we will try to be as respectful as, as possible for, to you. 
uh, to your people and to the Fremen society. And Stilgar looks at him in the eye and goes, <laughs> and he spits, <laughs> and he spits, and he's like, it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And it was like about to like fucking stab Javier Bardem. But, but, uh, but Jason Moe's like, oh, guys, it, it, it's, it, it's okay. No, we, we, we thank you, Stilgar, for sharing the moisture of your body. We, too, return the, the respectful moisture. And he spits, and everyone starts going, pff, pff, pff. everyone starts, it's gross. Everyone starts spitting everywhere. And at one point, like, Jason Moe, he did a fucking loogie, too. He went, I was like, I, was, I don't want that moisture. I don't want no loogie spit. No, thank you. Even if I was, even if I was a friend, I'm like, I'm not gonna drink that. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. And everyone does it. And you know, Oscar is like, okay, cool. We all spat each other. Awesome. Uh, do you want to like stay for dinner? Do your people want to stay for dinner? We continue. He's like, no. Uh, 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 honor dictates I'd be elsewhere. But you're you're a good guy. You're a good guy, Oscar Isaac. And uh, he looks at um, Paul. And, you know, Paul says a, a phrase in Fremen to him, and he's like, holy shit, this guy must be the Messiah. Anyway, I got to go. And he leaves. It's like one word he says. He's like, he, that, 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 that's a sign. He's the Messiah. And so he leaves at one point. And they're like, ah, oh, that went pretty fucking cool. That went pretty good, right? And eventually, you know, Paul, he's become obsessed with the Fremen because he keeps dr dreaming of this Fremen girl named Zendaya, good old, good old Chani. And it sounds like a fucking coffee drink. I get it to Starbucks, chap. Anyway, he's he's like watching like uh, a documentary about the Fremen, you know, in his in his bedroom and shit. And you know, there's like there's like a hologram, you know, projector. It's pretty cool. And he's like, you know, he eventually he gets up. And he's like looking at how uh, uh, like the the the. Um, the flora and fauna of of Dune kind of operates, and it's like this underground, like kind of like bush. And then in there is like this little mouse, this little like little mouse, which I guess uh, is the Muad'Dib. I guess that's the thing. It's like desert mouse. I think that's what Muad'Dib means or something in Dune. He's just like, I'm infatuated with this mouse. But when he gets up, though, we, he hears this, pss, hears like this burning. And we see this, this like little burn like in the wall and this ornate architecture, this architecture just kind of like it, it, it dissolves away. And this little robot wasp like comes out. I think it's called like a hunter seeker or a seeker hunter or something. And I guess these things were put in place like he was booby trapped. His room was booby trapped by the Harkonnens to, to assassinate people. And it, it, it detects motion. And so he's like, ah, fuck, that's a seeker hunter, hunter seeker. It's a little robo wasp. And so he hides in the hologram and shit. And at one point, like, the thing comes like super close to him because it kind of detects his movement. It's actually well done. And, uh, but again, it's like, it's like right next to his eye. Like if he moves, if he blinks, that thing's gonna go right into his eyeball and he's dead. But, uh, it moves away cause he's so still. And then eventually, uh, like his door opens and the Hunter Seeker's like, there you are, there's Paul. And it goes for him and he grabs it. He grabs it and crushes that shit. I would have been afraid that my, I would have hit the needle off my hand, but he grabbed it and it's the lady. It's the, <laughs> it's the, it's the screaming lady that, ah, <laughs> You know, funny enough, funny enough, she didn't scream there. <laughs> I would have been like, Woo! <laughs> when I, I saw a robot wasp, I would have freaked the fuck out. I would have been dead instantly. But <laughs> she doesn't do, her, doesn't do a weird scream thing, <laughs> which I thought, I was his point. That would have been the opportunity to do so. And um, their mentat feels really bad about it because they said, yeah, the city's safe. Fine, we checked everything. And they clearly didn't check everything because they find out like a Harkonnen soldier, like, uh, was inserted and buried into a, like a wall for like six fucking weeks and was waiting for the opportunity to like kill someone or at least kill the, the heir of Atreides, right? And um, I guess he killed him. I forget if, if they, they don't really say like if he like was killed by the Atreides or he like killed himself. I don't know. That's They don't really go into that. In any case, uh, but Mentat's like, uh, I'm sorry about that. I resign. And Oscar Isaac's like, listen, we fucking... We, we, we need, I need all the men I can get right now. Uh, fuck you and your honor. You're still serving on. Just, just, just find these goddamn spies and any of these Harkonnens that are still embedded in the city and the society, okay? We need, we need to get, sh we need to get shit done. Also, they have a whole issue where um, the Harkonnens left them all this faulty equipment, and, you know, because of that, it's going to be very difficult to get all the spice manufacturer. They got to fill these, like, these giant size, like, Leviathan size, like, barrels and things to then ship across the universe into the Emperor. And it's like, it's going to be very, very difficult. Very, very difficult, right? And it's like, oh, God damn it. 
Uh, but, um, you know, uh, Duke Atreides, he wants to survey the spice refining process, how they gather the spice, and then how they ship it off world. And I guess the Emperor has a advisor on the planet. Their name is like Dr. Kynes? Keynes? Dr. Keynes or something. Um, originally played by Max von Sydow in the original 84 film. Here it's different. It's a woman now. And um, they get they get their 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 poop suits as I like to call them chat, which is you know basically the the purpose as, as Doctor Kine explains, uh, she's like a fremen. I think she's a fremen too or something, or she's like you've been in, integrated into the fremen culture or something because her eyes are blue as fuck, and so she's constantly high on that spice, baby. And she's like, yeah, no, good to have you guys here. Um, let me explain your poop suits. And so she goes down the whole poop suits, how it's meant to protect yourself from the, you know, dunes, you know, uh, high temperatures and it's meant to retain moisture. And anytime you would sweat or piss or poop or you do whatever, uh, it's meant to collect that moisture, purify it, and then it uses a, a source of drinking water for you. Right. And so that's the purpose of the suit. And she's going over everyone's suits. And she, you know, making sure everyone's, you know, got their, their boots on right and they got their gloves on tight, right? And she gets to Paul and she's like, Paul, you put your boots on correctly. Have you worn a poop suit before? He's like, nah, just, just looked like the way to put them on. And she's like, oh my God, this guy's the Messiah. <laughs> Holy shit. You hear the, you hear the, you hear the, you hear the handmaid in the back. You hear the lady in waiting in the back going, ah. <laughs> I was like, quiet, you, quiet. <laughs> he put his boots on correctly. He's the Messiah. <laughs> that one's like, okay. <laughs> so let's get in our cool uh, dragonfly spaceships <laughs> and go out and see some fucking sandworms, baby. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> and, so, and I have to, again, all the, all the spaceships, all the technology, uh, like the look of the world is amazing. Like, I'm not knocking that at all. Like, this is, like, very well fucking done. This is some of the best CGI I have seen in, like, a science fiction film. I mean, certainly this day. It's, like, it's great. It looks really fucking good. No doubt about that. And I like the designs of the ships. And we see some other ships early. We saw when we're on the, uh, like, what, Duncan. Duncan's flying a ship on the Trades Homeworld. Cal Callahan? Is that what it's called? Good old Callahan Auto Parts. And, um... It's like, it's like this, it's not like the Dragonfly ship, it's something different. I thought that was pretty cool. It's like gliding across the water and stuff. I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, but we see, but for the desert environment, they have like these giant like, um, like Dragonfly ships. Dragonflies or like locusts. And I thought that's pretty fucking cool. That's a really neat design, like visually. And then the, like, the, like the wings would go like, like super fast and then goes boo and then it shoots off. And so it's like it's like they're flying. They got like uh, they got three ships that they go out to see the the spice collectors, the spice. I think they call them the harvesters, the spice harvesters. And they go out there, and like Oscar Isaac, he wanted to be a pilot, so he's like, I want to fly. <laughs> it's like, all right, you can fly. And and they they they're above one of the spice harvesters, and it's like this huge again, like giant Leviathan sized thing, right? Seemingly so, I mean, like this monster like sized like land vehicle. And it's it's getting all the spice. You can see the spice on the surface. It's kind of like this like like this bluish or no, excuse me, not. It's like orange like cinder, right? It's pretty cool. It's like visually amazing. And um, like Duke Atreides starts asking, or I think maybe it's Paul, but one of them. One of the one. Atreides starts asking questions, and he asks, uh, "So don't the you know the the fucking graboids?" <laughs> Don't the sandworms, like, detect the motion? Like, oh, yeah, no, they do, they do. But we have, like, these little floaty spheres. They have, like, these little drones that detect, like, a, a sandworm, you know, is in the distance or something like that. And, I think, and it's Duke Leto. Duke Leto's like, is that a sandworm over there? <laughs> like, fuck it, the drones suck because they didn't spot it because he sees this huge, like, pillow of, um, or billow, I should say, billow of uh, sand, sand dust. And uh, Keys like looks at it, goes, ah, yeah, 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 that's a sandworm. Good eye, good eyes, Duke Leto. He's like, thank you. And um, you know, uh, Paul's like, well, shouldn't those shouldn't those guys in the fucking thing be evacuated? They're like, oh, we got that. Like they're they're apparently they're forced to like harvest spice until like the very last minute, like as much as you can get. And then they have like these these giant like. Um, Vehicles, these flying vehicles come in that then uh, attach to the the harvester and then lift it up and then take it back to the uh, to the city and then they you know they process the spice there and they put it in the giant industrial barrels and so we see one of these giant hovercrafts come in this big old thing has these clamps got these big old clamps and it goes boop 
rope and it fires out the clams. Clam number one, attach. Clam number two, attach. Clam number three, attach. Clam number four, derpy. They got themselves a derpy clam, and the clam's like, I'm trying my best, but not good enough. And they can't lift that fucking thing off. And it's like, well, that's not good because that sandworm is a coming. And at this point, Duke of Trade, this shows like, you know, despite being a sad dad and, you know, not really paying pay attention to the, to, to the warning signs and danger signs. He's like, oh, shit, we got to save those guys. And he's like, sir, but these, you know, the ships can only, like, our ships can carry, like, six people each. But there's, like, a crew of, like, 21. And so it's like, well, fuck, but we're going to have to leave some guys behind. Duke Trey's like, no, no, we would not leave a man behind. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool of him. And so he's like, empty our fucking uh, our dragonfly ships as much as possible to, so, you know, we won't have as much weight. I'll be able to take off. And so Paul's like, I want to help. And so he goes out there and, you know, they, they get the workers to get, to fuck, fuck the thing. Fuck the harvester. Like, I, again, I like Duke Leto here because he's basically saying, like, fuck all that bullshit. You're not, you're, uh, a single human life is worth more than a fucking barrel of spice. I don't give a shit. And he's like, get your asses out of there. And so they all start running out. And, but then Paul, he gets a big old whiff of that spice. He goes, oh, and he has a fucking reaction to it. He's like, oh, God. And he's like, Zendaya. And Zendaya's like, come to me, Paul. Come to me. He's like, I want to come to you, Zendaya. I really, really do. And they load all the guys up there. They load all the guys up there on the, on the dragonfly ships. And uh, Gurney, Josh Bill, and he's there. He's like, where the fuck's Paul? And they're like, we don't know. And he has to go out there and save his ass because he's tripping, uh, dreaming about uh, Zendaya having visions and shit. Uh, he's like, get your ass up. And they and they take and it's cool. It's a cool like action sequence. It's it's short, but it's like it shows the scale of the worms where they fucking trying to run as fast as they can. This thing is just so fucking massive, and the like the whole the whole world is just shaking. They do manage to board the vehicle, the giant dragonfly ship, and Paul's like hanging on to Gurney like this, and we see just like as as big as that harvester was, the sandworm is just truly enormous, and it literally just vores. It vores the uh, the harvester like it's fucking nothing. And they're like, oh my god, that was crazy. And that's one of the big you know action sequences um, of the movie. Uh, eventually, we cut to I think it's called the I don't know what they're called. Like they're like these special warriors that that serve the emperor, like his honor guard, Sadakur. Sadakar? I think they're called like Sadakar Wars and they and they dark line they don't know that one they don't they dark they that they sound like the guy from um the water boy they sound like the Bayou guy you know the hillbilly guy that's they sound that's what they sound like <laughs> they sound like that guy and uh, I guess they're performing this ritual before they go into battle or something and uh, David Dallas Malchin is there. And he's like negotiating on behalf of the Harkonnens. And he's just like, oh, we, we've heard that the Atreides forces are the best trained in the universe. They've been trained by, you know, Gurney and, and Duncan Idaho. And the guy goes, they don't have on that. They're not a good that. We got a lot of that. We don't need. We got people got on that. We bleed them. Bleed them. It was good by the war. Anyway. And so the translation, as far as I knew, is we're the fucking best in the universe. We serve the emperor. We fucking have these guys crucified over there. And we are literally bleeding them dry to then like cover our bodies in, in the blood of our enemies. And I'm just like, if you say so, sir, <laughs> I need I need some subtitles for him. <laughs> And so it's like, okay. Dismount is like, okay, Jesus, I'm just telling you that they're they're very well trained. Um uh, <laughs> eventually we uh we cut back to Doom, we cut back to Arrakis, and we're introduced to this character named Dr. Yu who shows up maybe like twice in the movie, three times in the movie, and he's like the personal physician of House Atreides or something, or at least on Dune, he's the personal physician. And, like, we don't really know, like, that much about this guy at all. Like, no, we know nothing about this fucking guy. Uh, well, it turns out um, he betrays everybody. This Dr. U Ue, Ue, that's his name. It's like, Yu, what's his name? Ue, his name is Dr. Ue. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to betray everybody. And um, the reason is because we learn, again, not by, we, we, we don't see it. I, 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 this, this, is, this is a big, I have a big issue with this part of the movie. Like, we're introduced to this character named Dr. Ue who we've never really met before, really had any time to like get to know as a person. And we find out that he, he, he's the kind of catalyst for this whole betrayal 
where his wife was kidnapped by the Harkonnens and is like being tortured and like literally ripped apart, like being dismantled, like like she's a toy or something. And he's like, well, I don't want that. So I'm going to betray House Atreides so I can get my wife back. Now, the thing is, like we we learn about this via an exchange that he has later on with uh, Duke Atreides, right? And um, I'm just like, show me that. First of all, introduce me to this character so I get a sense of who he is as a person. So I can either like him or whatever. Uh, and, and then, like, just show me what happened to his fucking wife. Because I can understand. Because at this point, I'm just like, yeah, fuck this guy. I don't know who this guy is. And I was like, it's just, it's very weird. And it's the same in the book, too. It's like, again, I, I think there could have been a better way to showcase this. They just don't. He's just kind of like, yeah, I betrayed it because my wife that, you know, you guys didn't know about her see. Yeah, she got kidnapped and stuff. And so I'm going to just, you know, fuck up your whole world. And I was like, okay, well, that's disappointing. And so, yeah, it's later that night on Dune or something. Paul's going to sleep and shit. He's having fucking visions. And everybody's like, oh, Zendaya. And um, at one point, uh, Duke of Trace, he's, he's bush. He's like, I need, a, I need a good day. I need a massage from my concubine. Lady Jessica even says, he says, you know, I'm sorry. I should have just married you. I don't know why I just kept you as a concubine. You're pretty cool, Lady Jessica. She's like, you're pretty cool too, Oscar Isaac. He's like, thanks. Thanks. And... Um, he gets up, he gets up one day because he, uh, or that later that night, because he sees like this weird flash in the distance. He's like, what the fuck's that flash thing? That's weird. It looks like something's going on in the city. And it's like, oh, someone's signaling to, to, some, to someone. So he gets up and he wants to get a closer look and he goes down like this long hallway, right? And <laughs> yeah, we, we hear her before we see her. Ah! <laughs> It's the handmaiden woman. It's like, I, I know who that is. <laughs> and so he, he goes to this crumpled body and he turns the woman over and she's got, she did like, she's been impaled by the dagger. And she's like, you, you should keep this fucking dagger. Give it to Paul. Give it to Paul, you know, uh, Trades. Apparently not. She fell on that shit or more likely she was stabbed. And she's like, ah, and she's like, ah, and she gets one last wail out before, um, Duke Atreides is shot from behind, like uh, I guess a like a dart or something is 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 penetrating his uh, personal shield and he can't get at it because it's like awkward. He's like, oh fuck, I can't reach it and grab that thing. So it penetrates the shield and it just it um it it puts some type of like uh, toxin into him and it basically renders him completely helpless. He can't move his body. Some type of paralysis. And then doctor and he's like, who could have betrayed me? And I was like, you're so, you took him in like so many like more interesting people that could have betrayed him and it's like and it, it, and it's like it was me it was me duke leto dr ua who was introduced like maybe one scene ago it's it was me and then he just gives this exposition he's like listen i'm real sorry about this but i'm doing this because baron harkonnen or harkonnen he has my wife and he's been like dismantling her like a doll or whatever and um yeah i'm not about that uh however uh, you can kill the Duke you, you, in your, with your last breath. And he says, here. And he gets out, like, this false tooth. He, like, he he, he removes the, the Duke's back tooth, and he puts this false tooth in. He says, bite down that hard, and you will unleash a, a deadly poison. And so you will die, but so will the Duke. Oh, excuse me, so will the Baron and everyone else in that fucking room when he talks to you, okay? Because he wants to talk, he wants to monologue for a little bit. Not really, he doesn't really monologue at all. He says he's going to monologue, but he doesn't really do it. He's like, cool, and he's like, Oscar Isaac's like, and so I guess I take that as a yes. Um, and so he puts the tooth in there, and uh, later, later, uh, oh yeah, we find out that Lady Jessica and Paul, they have been abducted by the Harkonnens, uh, who have then proceeded to start their invasion of the of the planet, and the invasion is very well done. Like all the, because everyone's you know taken aback, it's a surprise attack. Um, the the Atreides forces are completely caught off guard. Like at one point, like we got to get our fucking forces in the sky. It's like too late because they're already bombarding them from from above. Really cool uh, how they do that. And we see uh, Gurney, Josh Brolin's character, like, run out. Like, oh, fucking shit. Like, get, get, you get the scale of the battle, like, how big it is. And, again, all the battle sequences are very well done. Like, it's like, wow, this is gorgeous and terrifying. Like, it's just, like, just the scope of it, right? It's really awe-inspiring, sure. And um, 
all these uh, uh, Harkonnen uh, landing crafts, you know, they land, and Gurney's like, well, yeah, let's fucking fight tonight and die later. Like, okay. And they charge them, and they, and they engage them in battle and things. It's very, it's very well done. There's also a shot uh, where we see these Atreides uh, soldiers that are on the staircase, and they're like, and there's like only a few of them, but... Like, they're defending it, so the Harkonnens can't, like, get inside. And they start slaughtering the Harkonnens. Like, Harkonnens clearly aren't as, as talented warriors as the Atreides are. So, you know, you know, uh, obviously, that's why they needed the, 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 the Saudokar, or whatever, whatever the hell they're called, to assist. And the Saudokar, they have, like, these kind of paratroopers that land behind the Atreides, and then they attack them from behind. They're like, oh, fuck. And then they just get, you know, uh, pinched, and they, they get defeated. And, um... Eventually, I mean, you know, uh, oh yeah, Duncan Idaho, he, he's like, I gotta get the fuck out of here too. And so he gets, uh, he has some really cool action sequences where he's trying to be stealthy, but take out as many guys as possible. Eventually he gets up to this landing platform so he can steal like a dragonfly ship. And he fights off some of these Harkonnens. And these, some of the Harkonnens just straight up give up. They're like, all right, all right fuck this. We're not, we're not going to engage. He's like, yeah, fuck you. And he gets into his cool um, dragonfly ship. And then we get the, I forgot about the sequence in, when I watched the movie originally. He's flying out of the city, but like one of the Harkonnen like, capital ships has this like really cool like blue laser that like fires down. It's like tracking his ship. And it's like, oh man, it's like this consistent beam. And I thought that was pretty cool as he's like dodging and doing all these cool moves and he gets out of the city, right? I was like, that was pretty awesome. And he manages to escape. Uh, and then we see, you know, the fat fuck himself the floating in, you know, alongside his, his troops and the Sadakar, you know, royal soldiers. And then we, uh, we cut to Oscar Isaac. He's like, ah, he like wakes up a little bit. Completely butt ass naked. And he's sitting in his chair, and uh, like across from him, across this, across this huge ornate table, is um, a Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, who's just munching on what looks like some seafood. I have to admit, I want to, I want to eat that fucking like whatever the hell he's eating. Chase eating some shellfish, and like um, looks like calamari or octopus, and he is going to fucking town. He's like, oh, 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 ah. Cousin, he calls him cousin. Because this is another thing, this is another detail they reveal. But he's like, cousin, I, 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 I'm so jealous of your personal chef. D uh, delicious. You have the compliments of, of House Harkonnen, Baron Harkonnen. And this is the first time where they mention that H House Harkonnen and, and House Atreides are related. And, like, they never bring up again. <laughs> I'm just like, well, that's interesting. It's like these houses that we were told have been at war with each other for, like, hundreds of years, but they are family. It's like, this is kind of cool. Let's go into more of this. Nope, we're not getting into more of that. I'm just like, okay. And um, uh, they, uh, he's like, bring in. Oh, that's the thing, because they get Davis Mel's Malchian, and he's like, uh, Lord Baron. He's like, yeah, what's up? And he's like, uh, the doctor, Dr. Uh, UA is here. He's like, oh, yeah. The doctor. Bring him in. And so they bring in Dr. Ua. And Dr. Uh, Ua is like, hey, so I did all the, everything for you. I brought down, they brought down the shields and shit. Like I betrayed the Atreides and things. And he's like, yeah, you're dead. You're the traitor, all right. And he's like, cool. So can you, can you free my wife? And he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, your wife. And I like how he floats in the movie. I, I do like that. How he, you know, it's like, it's like connected to a spinal column this giant robotic spine and he like it has like this weird sound where it comes it's like it's I can't even describe it it's like a, it's like a clicking clacking noise it's really in really good sound design in the movie and he and he, and he just <laughs> it kind of floats up a little bit and he kind of like slides across the table or like, uh, like his footsies is the, the tips of his toes are like dragging across the table and then he just kind of he just kind of like he he like uh moves over first he kind of like sits and then he like moves over to the doctor and he's like, mm. so um, what do you want me to do? And he's like, I just want you to free my wife. And he's like, oh yeah, yes, yes, your wife will be free. And he grabs his head and he is like, go ahead and join her in your in her freedom. And, ah! and he cuts his head off and it's like, oh, that didn't work out very well. <laughs> And he, he throws the guy's so implying, like, I killed your wife a long time ago. Join her in fucking freedom. Freedom of death. Killed him. And then he sits his big lard ass down on the table, and he's like, ah, cousin, look at you. Look at you now. It's like your, your son is dead. Your concubine is dead. 
House Atreides falls tonight. The Emperor, because that's the thing. The Emperor was jealous of like the the Atreides family because all the houses look up to them because they are like super cool and super great. And he's like, the, the Emperor is a jealous man, and you should have known. You should have known the Emperor would do this to you. Uh, that you you thought you could take my dune, my Arrakis from me, from a house Harkonnen. No, you cannot. It's like, oh shit, don't don't suddenly raise your voice uh, all of a sudden, Lord Vladimir Harkonnen. It's the first time you did. And um, and then Duke Atreides starts going, uh, 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 and he's like, oh shit, you got something to say to me? What do you got to say? And he like turns his, sh- I like that his personal shield's like this ring. It's like this giant fucking like sapphire ring. He clicks it. And he gets really close to him. And, he, and then Oscar's like, what did you say? What did you say? And, and um, I imagine Oscar Isaac would say, fuck you! And he bites down his tooth and... <laughs> he unleashes the poison. Everyone's like, oh, shit! And they close those doors fast. And the, the Duke's like... Arr, arr, the, the, the Baron's like... Arr, 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 arr. He's like, uh-oh. That big boy's inhaling all that, all that fart. All that Oscar Isaac fart. Um, and, uh, like, David is malching. He fucking dies. He dies. That's probably not good. Um... Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, we cut and uh, we're with Paul. We're with Paul and Lady Jessica, and they're basically being uh, flown out to the desert to be dropped off to then die, either due to exposure, the elements, or eaten by a sandworm, right? Now, also, they oh, this introduced sign language. There's sign language in this movie. So even though, like, uh, Lady Jessica's gagged because if she uses the voice, you know, these guys get fucked up, right? And uh, she's basically telling Paul, like, what to do. And Paul attempts to use the voice at one point on one of the uh, Harkonnen troopers, and the guy's like, "Shut the fuck up!" And he's like, he punches him in the gut, and then Har- and Paul he he does it again. And he's like, "Oh shit!" And he like he listens, and you know Paul tells him to free uh, his mother, and uh, he does so, and she removes the gag, and the pilot's like, "No, don't fucking do that!" And as soon as that happens, then all shit breaks loose because then she tells the one guy to stab the this other guy. This guy is deaf. He's like, "Who are you?" And then stabs him in the gut he falls out of the goddamn dragonfly spaceship and then they she tells him to kill the pilot and they do that and then she takes the knife and she stabs him herself and eventually the dragonfly ship it like lands and but i guess they i guess they they were always pl- they always planned to have it like they sabotage it so these three fuckers were gonna die no matter what and so yeah, they're like, all right, we're out here. But, uh, but, but apparently, Dr. Yue, like, left them this survival pack, you know? Like, he never he didn't want them to die, so to help them, you know, escape or whatever. So, okay. And so they, they eventually, they, they get out there. They watch the battlefield of, you know, their entire lives just burned away in the city, right? It's very sad. And um, they eventually set up shop, and they have this, like, little tent uh, that they get up there, protecting from the heat and everything, the elements, and they read Dr. U. And then they just tell us what happened to Dr. U again. It's like, I fucking know. I know what happened to goddamn Dr. U already, all right? Jesus, I don't give a shit about him or his fucking wife, all right? Maybe I could have cared if he actually showed me. Um, But uh, then it's, like, the next morning, and, you know, the Harkonnens, they go into the room to try to, like, clean up all the dead bodies and get, like, a sense of, like, what happened to find also that the Baron's dead. The Baron has managed to, like, he's, like, I guess he didn't in- ingest most of the poison. He's, like, on, he's, like, on the ceiling. He, 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 you know, he rose so high that to avoid it. And he's, he's, like, fucked up, though. <laughs> he's, like, he's really fucked up. And they're like, you know what the Baron, you know what Baron Harkonnen, what Baron Vladimir Harkonnen needs? He needs a bubble bath. He needs a bubble bath, chat. And so they draw him a nice bubble bath, which is also like a mud bath. And uh, he likes to go underwater. And there's like, this one shot where uh, Dave Bautista's back in the movie. He's like, Uncle, where are you? And he's like, I'm under the water. <laughs> and he comes up. And I guess it's like some type of healing, like back to tank thing. And um, uh, he... Uh, he explains, like, I'm pretty fucked up right now. However, uh, I think Batista's character's name is Raba. Raba. And he's like, yes, uncle. And he's just like, uh, Dune. Like, he also asked about, is, is Paul Atreides dead and everything? They said they found the uh, ship, but they didn't find him. And he's like, we got to make sure those fuckers are dead. You got, we, gotta, we have to make absolutely sure. Squeeze them, Raba. Squeeze Dune, my Dune. He's like, I will, uncle. And he's like, okay, cool. Eventually, uh, Paul and, and Paul's mad at Jessica because she's been lying to him her entire life because, you know, he's, he's the Kwanzaa cataract and he's kind of pissed off at his mom. They eventually meet up with um, 
Oh, God, who is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they meet up with uh, some Fremen, uh, some loyal Atreides troops, uh, Duncan Idaho, and also uh, Dr. Kynes, Keynes, whatever her name is. That, them. And they kind of hole up, and Paul puts together this plan. This is Paul's plan. He's like, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to seek vengeance against uh, uh, the Harkonnens and the Emperor Shaddam, good old Christopher Walken. He ain't going to be Walken no more when I get my hands on him. Uh, we're going to get revenge, and I'm going to marry his daughter, so or one of his daughters, Florence Pugh. I'm going to marry Florence Pugh. I'm going to marry Florence Pugh so then I can become emperor. And Duncan Idaho is like, okay, I feel like there's some steps missing here. <laughs> But uh, uh, okay, but I guess Paul's whole thing is he's like, listen, the, 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 the Fremen, the, the Fremen's the answer. Like, we need to get their help to fight against their opponents. Everyone thinks I'm like this goddamn messiah, so I'm going to use that to my benefit. Everyone thinks I'm the fucking Kwanzaa cataract or, you know, whatever they're calling me. So let's go ahead and do that. Lady Jessica's like, I'm not sure about that. He's like, Mom, shut the fuck up. You've been lying to me this whole time. But meanwhile, chat... Uh, the the Harkonnens and the Sadakar, or whatever they're called, they find out where Paul is, uh, uh, and his mom are all shacked up. They go to attack, right? And Duncan Idaho is like, "Well, I'm just gonna let give you guys time to escape. I'm gonna sacrifice myself." And Paul actually has a genuine reaction. He's just like, "No, no, Duncan," because everyone everyone fucking loves Duncan Idaho in this movie. Chad, he's got he's got personality, and he's like, "Nah, I guess I'm not gonna be in the sequel, even though it'd be kind of cool if I was." So he he ends up fighting a lot of the Harkonnen and the Sadarkar soldiers. He fucks a lot of them up, kills a lot of them. But they get him. They start, they start, you know, they start stabbing him. Chad, he gets stabbed a lot. And sadly, Chad, Duncan Idaho, he passes away. He is killed by the Harkonnens and the Sadakar. Meanwhile, Dr. Keene's like, I'm going to also be a distraction. I am the only black person in this movie, so I shall perform a black sacrifice for you, okay? That is, that is my obligation. Paul, you are the Messiah. You put your boots on correctly, that blew my fucking mind. Lead my people to glorious purpose. And so they have this, um, they have this shake weight thing. <laughs> they got this, like, they got, like, this giant shake weight fleshlight thing. They got a dune popcorn bucket. So it's like, oh, it's in the movie. They have this dune popcorn bucket that's, like, you know, auto like, you know, you turn on, you know, it's not like you have to do it yourself, Chad. It's, just, uh, it's automated, baby. It's automated. And what they do is it, it basically creates a, a vibration that attracts sandworms, right? And so she sets this thing up in the desert, plugs that thing, and it starts just pumping. It just starts pumping and coming into that sand chat. And the sandworms are like, oh, my God, what is that delicious vibration I'm sensing? I'm going to go over there. And so... Um, this giant sandworm starts coming over there. Meanwhile, Dr. Kine, she's holding off all these Harkonnen troops and shit, and she's doing, she's doing a pretty good job, doing a pretty good job. Uh, but then the sandworm's like, oh my god, yes, coming to me! And it vores them, it vores them in pretty cool, dramatic fashion, chat. Like, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. But she, she performs the sacrifice in order for the two white characters, the white messiah, to live. <laughs> He put his boots on correctly, and I'm thinking, like, I'm going to die for this white kid. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and, um, oh, my God. Uh, eventually, Paul and Jessica, they take refuge, but they meet up with some Fremen who are like, fuck these guys. I don't care that you're a... a they meet up with Spit Boy. They meet up with Stilgar the Spit Boy. And he's like, oh, I remember you. Yeah, you said that nice thing to me. Yeah, you might be the Messiah, but... You know, they're like, oh, and we also meet Zendaya for the first time, truly meet her for the first time. And Paul's like, oh, you've been in my dream. She's like, get away from me, you fucking creep. I don't know who you are, which is like, that's, that's, the, that's, a, that's a justifiable reaction. <laughs> I'm like, I'm on her side. I'm on her side on, on that one. He's like, I don't, I don't know who you are. Um, and uh, they explain their situation to the Fremen. And this is, by the way, this is the last scene in the movie, by the way, which is kind of nuts. This is literally the last scene. <laughs> it's like, it comes out, of, it kind of feels so weird and awkward. Um, but... Uh, they explain your situation, and, you know, Spitboy still guards, like, okay, cool, no, that's cool, um, I mean, I mean, we'll take Lady Jessica, because she'll, she'll be, like, like, cool breeding stock, she'll be, like, a nice breeder for us, that's nice, you know, very progressive on Dune, <laughs> very, very progressive society on Arrakis, we're gonna use, we're gonna turn your mother into a broodmare, um, but you, I don't know, man, we got a lot of, we got a lot of men, and, you know, 
eh, I'm not sure. But you know, some, some of the Fremen are like, nah, he, he seems kind of cool. He could be the Maasai. He put his boots on correctly. But there's like this one fucking guy. There's this one guy <laughs> who fucking hates Paul Chat. Just hates him. I don't know what I'm gonna call. I forget what his name is. They call him. I forget. He's like school. school I'm gonna call him Skechers. I'm gonna call him Skechers. Chat. It's good old like the shoe, like the sneaker. <laughs> His name is like his name is like Skechers, and Skechers is like fuck you. <laughs> I don't like you. I don't like the way you look. And I am the second black character in this movie, and I do not like how you dealt with that other black person. <laughs> and I will not be performing a blackerface. And Paul's like, all right, so what do we do? And he's like, I challenge you to a duel. Would be Messiah. And Paul's like. Okay, <laughs> and so thankfully, Lady Jessica, she has the bone knife that the ah lady uh, was stabbed with, and so she's like, "Here, this this was given to you," and she's like, "Cool," and so Paul and Skechers they they face each other, and you know Paul is like, "I wish he wouldn't have to come come to this man." And he's like, don't fucking apologize to me because I'm going to kill you. He's like, okay. And so they start dueling chat, you know, and it's a pretty good choreography, pretty good choreography for the, for the duel. Not too fancy, not too, you know, over the top. Uh, Paul fucks him up, though. Paul stabs the hell out of him. And he's like, this not, this might not be a black or fight, but a, another black man is dying in this movie. And bah! And he just gets him. And the guy's like, ah, fuck. And Paul's like, shh, shh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I forgive you, black man. And he dies, and he passes away. And, you know, the Fremen are like, all right, well, uh, yeah, I guess you can you can replace Skechers. You're, you're the new Skechers now, uh, Paul. And he's like, I prefer to be called Muad'Dib. He's like, all right, good old Muad'Dib. Muad'Dib it is, Desert Mouse. And and they they, they go ahead, and they pack up Skechers' body. But, um... Uh, because, you know, they're like, we're gonna eat him. And they're like, really? They're like, yeah, I mean, he's got moisture inside of him. He's got good meat, you know? Dark meat's delicious. <laughs> He's deli he's gonna be scrumptious, <laughs> and so they pack his shit up, and then uh, you know Zendaya's like, "Hey, that was pretty badass when you killed that guy." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool." I guess te technically Zendaya is the third black person in the movie. Yeah, I guess yeah, I guess so. So she thankfully does not get killed, <laughs> as far as I know. Could change up in the sequel for all I know. Uh, and she's like, "Yeah," uh, and they kind of start bonding over that guy that Paul killed. And eventually they're taken to like a Fremen community where Paul sees um, the uh, the Fremen riding the worm chat. And you're like, hey, isn't that pretty cool? He's like, hell yeah, that's desert power right there. That's what we need to take on the Harkonnens and the Emperor. And it's like, oh shit, what's the next scene going to be? And it's like, we don't get a next scene because the movie ends. <laughs> it's just like, oh, okay, shit. Well, that was a very abrupt ending. And, uh, yeah, Chad, that's my, that's my scene by scene by scene by scene breakdown of Dune Part 1, Sandworm Shenanigans with Paul. Um, so yeah, my opinion really on this movie really hasn't changed, to be perfectly honest. I, I mean, the visuals, the production design, the costumes, all the technical aspects of the film are great. Like, you're not gonna hear me criticize any of those. Like, th those are all across the board, very well done. Very well done. Incredible. Um, but when it comes to the story and the characters, I'm just like, yeah, this is just kind of flat for me. It's kind of like mediocre, to be perfectly honest. Like, I really like Jason Momoa as Duncan. I really liked him. There's a couple of exchanges that I think are pretty good being some of the other characters that are kind of funny. Like, I like the one with Spitboy, uh, Harvey Bardem. That was, that was a cool little scene. It's like, that was nice. But there's just so many scenes where... Um, it just kind of falls flat, and we're and we're constantly we're constantly told but not shown. There's a lot of telling and not showing. And also, just recently coming off of Avatar: the Last Airbender, I'm just like, oh god, it's like, can we not just do this heavy amounts of exposition? And then like these huge important plot points, and we're like, okay, this guy that literally betrays the entire Trades family. I don't even know who this fucker is. He has like maybe two scenes before he betrays everybody, and and it's like, oh, I did it because my wife was kidnapped. I'm like, can we see that at least? I feel like that's important. And so. Yeah, I um yeah, it's it's fine. It's fine. I don't but I have no really, you know, real affection towards it. Uh, uh, uh admiration for its technical aspects, no doubt, but in terms of the story, it was like definitely it feels like it feels like the first act and then like a a a a, a, th a third, not even a third, like a quarter of of a second act. And um 
Yeah, that was. I don't know. I, I found it un, uh, unsatisfying because there's so many great elements there, but yeah, the the characters and story just didn't do it with me. So I'm very curious then going into uh, Dune Part Two if, if they address the character stuff, you know, because I've get, because the, 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 there's I, I think there's just a lack of that. There's a lack of that in in Part One, a severe lack of it. So I don't know. That's just that's my opinions on Dune Part One, Sandworm shenanigans five minutes later but i want to hear from you guys you know because a lot of people love this movie a lot of people adored this film and they think it's uh fantastic but um let me know what you guys have to have to say i'm actually curious uh chris here is fourth because denzel's buddy from fences in the atreides human computer is the Atreides human oh oh that guy that guy yeah yeah you're right you're right yeah that guy that's true I get back to see Chad as yelling at Chris. What did I, what did I do? Oh, I, I guess I'm kind of like, I'm very lukewarm on Dune Part 1 still to this day. And I just, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's fine. All right, better get going, guys. Catch you later. Thank you, baby. Did you hope you enjoyed the review? Oh, come on. What's wrong with Tell No Show? Wait, never mind. <laughs> oh, man. You should have reviewed the, I have reviewed the original Dune 84. That's on my YouTube channel, Crab. You can check that out. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Do you see? Yeah, well, Chris, this is one of the times where I disagree with you, man. To me, this was one of the best movies the year came out, 2021, and it was great set up for part two, and I thought Rebecca Ferguson was a standout performance. Yeah, yeah, we're just on opposite sides. Dark meat is delicious. <laughs> you know what you did. No, because I haven't watched it, not for me, um, way too long. It's, it's pretty long. It's like two, over two and a half hours. I have to look at the, is it two hours and 20 minutes? I don't know how long it is. Let me see. Uh, 155 minutes. So, yeah, it's over. It's over two hours. Um, yeah, like two, two, two hours, two and a half hours. Let's see here. Um, no, I mean for a scene by scene. Oh, I have done a scene by scene. That's what I'm saying of the 84 film. I've done a scene by scene of the 84 film. Katria also hide. No good to have you, Katria. You know what you did. Uh, Hamilton, uh, uh, hi Chris, did you hear what happened on Double Toast last night? I did not. What happened? This review inspired me to turn on the 2021 movie, currently on the scene where the, the they first see the worms. And, and again, all, all that, all the, again, the, I, I think the technical aspects of this movie are great. Like, I'm not criticizing that. I think it's beautiful. I'm thinking like, this is, if you're, you know, if you're making a big sci-fi film, you know, on the level of this, it should look this way. Just look fucking immaculate, gorgeous. But it's just... Yeah, I just didn't really connect with any of these people in 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 the movie, um, or the story, and I'm 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 glad I watched it, uh, because it it made me more familiar. I was I I became reacquainted with the material again. It's like okay, okay, okay. I know where everyone is now, position technically, and what's what's to come. It's like okay, I get the what I get what I get what's at stake, you know. And so I'm just hoping that. They address, and people that have seen the movie, let me know, please, that they address, I mean, my criticisms of it. That's the thing. You know what's interesting? Because um, when I think of, like, Denny Villeneuve's, I haven't seen all of his filmography. I've seen, uh, well, exception of Dune Part Two. I've seen all of his English language films at this point, right? And, um, like, I think Prisoners might be my favorite movie of his. I love Prisoners, the, 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 the you know, the kidnapping movie. With Hugh Jackman, Jake Gyllenhaal, a number of other great actors. I love that film. And I love Sicario. And, like, those two movies just felt just so, gr I mean, not, so character-focused. I was going to say, I mean, they're grounded, certainly, but they, they felt very character-focused. And I really liked that. Along with just having, like, these, like, an, either an interesting mystery or these really, like, tense, you know, scenes, like the example of Sicario. So, and then we get to, like, Blade Runner 2049, and I really like Blade Runner 2040. Like, I, like, I think it's much better than Doom Part 1. Um, but even then, like in that movie, when I first saw it, I didn't love it. I didn't love it. I, I was hoping I would have like a, like a kind of a change of, like a change of heart uh, with, um, with Doom Part 1. Because when I, when I eventually bought Blade Runner 40, because I liked it enough, I'm like, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to watch it again. And I watched it again. I, I saw it over the course of like two sittings, and I really got into it like those, those, that, that second time I watched it. And I, I had more of a connection with the characters. But even then, I noticed, like, in Dune, excuse me, in, in Blade Runner 24, I didn't have as much dialogue as his previous films. And uh, it took a little while to get, like, a sense of who these characters were. Um, 
But I, but I still, I, I had a better appreciation for the movie later on. I actually ended up really, really liking it. But yeah, there just wasn't like, in terms of the character stuff, like I would say like the beginning of Dune 20, excuse me, I keep now messing up my, my, my Denny Villeneuve films. Like the, the, the exchange that Ryan Gosling's character and Dave Bautista's character have in the beginning of the film, and with just that exchange between the two of them, I think that is better than any other exchange, any other dialogue moment or characters talking to each other than in Dune Part 1. Just that initial scene. Like, I got a sense of, like, okay, who these people are, Dave Batista's character, who's not yelling, <laughs> which is nice, as uh, Raba, whoever his name is. And, uh, yeah, I just didn't really care for any of the the, the dialogue moments in, in Dune Part 1. I'm, I'm hoping they fix that. Believe me, I want to I, I wanna go into this movie. I don't want to be, like, that outlier, because I mean, maybe it might be interesting if I am. But, yeah, well, I mean, let me see what you guys are saying. But I just noticed that there's, like... The bigger his movies get now, the, the less focus on dialogue and the less focus on, like, the story at this point. He doesn't seem interested in that. It's weird. Maybe GG, I love this movie. I don't care what anyone says. The world building was amazing. Characters was amazing. The music was phenomenal. Easy one of the best of 21. Just wanted to say that real quick before... No, I get it. I, I understand. Like, a lot of people feel the way you do, clearly. Uh, that version wasn't saying that 84 film? Hell yeah. I want the tea. What happened on, on DT? What happened? Spill it. Spill that DTT. <laughs> I have it on 4K and it is stunning," says Bishop Sycamore. Uh, it seems it certain, most certainly is. I, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not like again criticizing the visuals at all. I want to make that clear. It seems like one of those movies where you more respect it. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I I respect it. I don't love it. I actually know what I actually know what it's about now. Oh, for Dune, gotcha. You listen to DT earlier. Not sure what happened. Oh shit. I don't know. Someone sent an email to Gurv, a picture of their balls. Gurv accidentally showed for, for, oh, oh, that's, oh, troll post. Oh, well. Ladies, Chris, I had a similar reaction to part one, but I also fell asleep. I didn't fall asleep. You know, I, I guess, I don't, well, well, the next time I watched, I wasn't bored. I wasn't bored, but I was just kind of, um, I don't know, I just, I was uninterested in these people. That's the thing. Like, thankfully, there was something, there was always something interesting to look at. There was always something interesting to look at. Like, I like the look of this world quite a bit. Again, the production design is, you know, fucking 10 out of 10. But um, these people, I'm just like, yeah, I'm just not really invested in your story at all, which I feel like I should be.